You have a quorum. Begin with introductions. I am Dennis Heisey, El Paso County Commissioner. And to my left, Mark Snyder, Mayor of Manatee Springs. Rob McDonald, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Don Knight, City of Colorado Springs. Joel Miller, City of Colorado Springs. David Turley, uh, Mayor of Woodland Park. Keith McEvery, Mayor of Tyler Raymond. Jim Moore, representing Military Affairs Council. Travis Houston, Mayor of Monument. Jim Nall, Public Transportation Rep. Mark Wallaby, <clears throat> Park County Commissioner. Norm Stein, Teller County Commissioner. Andy Pico, City Council, Colorado Springs. Back to Rich. Rich Muzzy, PBACG. Kate Hatton, PBACG. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. Can you kind of tell us what you do at PPACG? Uh, <laughs> you don't know by now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the Pikes Peak Area Council Government Environmental Program Manager. Uh, Kate Hatton, Pikes Peak Area Council Government's uh, Military Impact Planning Program Manager. Beverly Maeski, Financial Manager. Dallas Jamison, Senior Policy Communications Advisor. Craig Casper, Transportation Director. Jim. Jim Godfrey, Chair of the CAC. James DeFlorian, Marcel Day, uh, Supporting Air Force Base. Ben Newman, Air Force Base Command. Uh, Tom Casalara, Development Services Director for Monument and Chair of the PAC. Victoria Chavez, El Paso County. Thank you. So if you're representing Keith next week. Moving on. Agenda approval. Any changes to the agenda? Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda is approved. Public comment. This would be the time when Anyone in the audience could just could uh, bring before the board an item not on the agenda, and we will actually go to uh, Rob McDonald here, even though he's not in the audience. Rob, you have an item. I do have an item. Um, you heard Kate Hatton introduce herself with uh, dual titles, um, but for today's purpose, uh, we'd like to uh, thank Kate for five years of service to the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments as the Military Impact Planning Program Manager. Uh, she has a new title that she can talk about if she wants. But, uh, she, uh, she's been five out of the six years leading the Military Impact Planning effort, which, as you'll hear today, uh, directly relates to the Fort Carson Growth Plan. And we looked at uh, five years clicking off extremely fast. Um, I think Dennis and I both said, what? Well, Five? How'd five years go by that fast? And we'll let Kate comment if she wants to, but we want to uh, honor her with uh, a plaque honoring that achievement and also uh, uh, a new notebook so she can start on writing new notes on her next five years. So, Kate, thank you so much. Mayor Turley. But you know, Kate can get 10 years worth of work. <laughs> you can pick one, Dennis, and I'll do the other. He's the work side, I'm the front side. Okay, okay. Thank you. And here, a clean slate, so to speak. Oh, look speak. at that. So there you go. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Kate. Yes. Two and a half years, she'd be really doubling it up. We had a few folks join, join us after introductions. We have Representative Pete Lee. Thank you, sir. Who else do we have in the audience that, that snuck in and did not introduce themselves? <laughs> Thank you. Any other public comment items? Seeing none, item number four is the consent calendar. Anybody have a reason to ask that any of these be pulled off the consent calendar? If not, do we have a motion to approve? Oh, we do. Mr. Knight. Before we, I have a question whether the minutes need to be pulled off or not. Maybe clarification. But in there it said uh, City of Council, Spring Council Member Don Knight moved to extend the MOU for a period of one year. The motion you carried unanimously, but then to develop a framework to be back, be brought back in one year, 
do we have a status update on whether the MOU got countersigned by CODT? If it did not, I, I kind of hope the process – I don't remember saying, you know, come back with a new plan in one year as our second motion. It was come back – I thought it was a little bit faster than that. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good clarification, and uh, we can ask CDOT folks. I do not believe it was signed. I don't think the MOU that you sent forward was signed by CDOT, and I'll look to Craig if he's heard it, it was. Uh, what the director of planning for CDOT told me uh, via email was they were going to put it on the July commission agenda. So it's likely pending for their action, and they meet, I believe, next next week. But overall, I, whatever the new MOU is going to be, assuming the, the current one is not extended. I, my intent last month was not to take a whole year to go through that. Right. Uh, and I think it will be uh, when we report on the State Transportation Advisory Committee meeting. There's a meeting after that this Friday that talks about resource allocation. And Clerk and Recorder Williams will be at that meeting. I know uh, Craig will be at that meeting Friday. So that's going to start the process is trying to figure out the resource allocation for transportation funds statewide. So that starts Friday. And so I think the that should lead into if any other agreements would happen through CDOT and this board, uh, that's that's really where that'll start. Okay, so if we can amend amendments of B that it were that it's not one year to come back with a new MOU, but as soon as possible, then I move we approve the consent calendar with that uh, that amendment. Thank you. Sir. Any other comments? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. We have been joined by representative from the city of Fountain, Councilmember Sharon Brown. <clears throat> Item number five. Five A is the Transportation Advisory Committee. Tom, are you? You've got it. Good morning. I'm Tom Casuaro from Town of Monument. Uh, recently appointed chair once again for the TAC, um, but this is the first time I've been able to address the board because um, last time I was chair. We didn't do this, so <laughs> it's my first time, but I'm not nervous. Um, we, we had a fairly, um, fairly good meeting um, last month, uh, a lot of informational items more than anything else. Um, we talked about the uh, Unified Planning Work Program. Uh, the draft is being prepared by PPACG staff. We had an update on the uh, airport master plan, which was pretty interesting. Um, a GIS expert talked to us about the uh, planning area boundaries for the MPO. Uh, we had a healthy discussion about the ramp projects. I'm sure that's been a healthy discussion with a lot of people. Um, and on the NHS as well, which is a national highway system. The, the, uh, we're at the point where the Federal Highway uh, Administration is going to choose their uh, preferred roads to be on the system. Uh, we've given our recommendations. I, the board has as well. Um, we had a, a long discussion about whether or not some additional roads can be put on by the member entities that um, CDOT didn't see uh, fit to put on the list, and uh, several of the entities have done that. I know the county has as well. Um, so we'll see where that goes. There'll be some more discussion on that for sure. Um, we talked also about the uh, potential ballot initiative. Um, that was a just a discussion item, and, and Craig has probably a lot more information on that for you today. Um, and then we just talked about the small area forecast with the update that's going on and a status report on all of the projects through CDOT. And uh, other than that, it was it was fairly calm meeting, which was nice. <laughs> we usually have calm meetings now. We uh, we had some some raucous things when we were choosing projects um, a year or two ago, but um, everybody uh, cooperated at that time, which was nice to see. All, all of the uh, the entities, the Springs and the county and and the smaller towns, sort of worked together to get a, a good variety of projects in the tip. So we're all working together pretty well, and uh, hope to continue to do that. So thank you. Any questions Tom, questions for answer? Tom? Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. 5B is Community Advisory Committee. Jim Godfrey. Good morning. I'm Jim Godfrey, Chair of the CAC. Um, nothing to add. I just wanted to update you um, on 
in, in our minutes, item number 15, committee members. Um, our membership committee did interview two pokes, um, but just did not get an opportunity to get ahead of um, the timeline for submitting to this board. So we will have a recommendation for you next, uh, next meeting for uh, filling one of the vacant uh, positions uh, at the at-large position. So nothing much to add unless you've got any questions. Questions for Jim, Mayor yes, Hurley. We uh, threw the consent calendar today oh, no, for that. Go to our council meeting up in one park. We have a new member on here. You did, and and she she attended last meeting. We were glad to have her, and ha thank you for doing that as well as El Paso County. Um, we had the new member as well, so thank you for filling those positions. They're important to us. And us. Thank you. Item C, Regional Advisory Council, Al Williams. Welcome. Al does his best impression of me. So. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'd like to draw your attention to one item on the uh, report. We met on June 27th, and item number six, um, in the spring of the year, the State Unit on Aging provides to you and to us the approximate funding that's going to be effective July 1st. At about the same time, we have the forum for all of our providers who come and provide us their information, what they've done for the year, what they expect, what their expectations are, and what their needs are. And so about the same time, we're looking at requests from our providers and trying to adjust a budget that the State Union on Aging expects to be turned around very quickly, so it makes it a difficult situation for the RAC and the Technical Review Committee to do all this at once. So a su suggestion has been made that we adjust our schedule to allow our providers to come in other than that one time a year, um, and we'll look at that proposal at our upcoming meeting on July 25th um, to see if that works. In other words, to allow providers to come during the year and not just during that crunch time when we're trying to respond to the state unit on aging with a budget at the same time looking at requests from uh, our providers. So we hope that will be a better system to uh, adjudicate our response back to the state unit uh, by having prior information from those providers, and that's what we'll be looking at at our meeting on July 25th. Uh, on the 25th of July, we'll be meeting in Bailey, and I know all of you are just raring to go, so we'll have a caravan going to Bailey, Park County, for our next meeting. Very good. Questions? Thank you. Appreciate Suggestion. it. Suggestion. Yes. Eat at the cutthroat. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. The we'll do that. Cafe, yeah. And we're always to check with you before we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Five D is the Arkansas Fountain Coalition Urban River River Evaluation. <laughs> I have to short, I have to shorten that. Um, I'll be providing the update um, for the AFCUR meeting. Uh, we've been working on a project uh, part participation agreement among all 11 entities that are members of AFCUR, and that project participation agreement will be um, develop a project underneath the Pikes Peak Regional Water Authority. So that's being routed around to all the uh, dischargers and, and the legal staff. And we've, after about seven iterations of this agreement, we've actually come come to a final agreement, so we're getting that signed by all the entities. With regards to a recap of the Arkansas River Basin hearing, I'll be doing that as agenda items 7G, along with um, next steps for AFCUR. With that, are there any questions? Questions. Thank you. Thanks. Item 6, are our action items. 6A, Fort Carson Regional Growth Plan Transition Report. Kate Hatton. Good morning, Kate Hatton with PPACG. Um, just wanted to be, what you have before you is the final Fort Carson Regional Growth Plan Report under our grant with OEA. This is the what we call the transition report. It includes kind of a brief summary of where we've been, how we got there, and where we're going, and really what we've done to address military community partnering, um, look at the community impacts of Fort Carson growth, the implementation that we've done around the recommendations to support Fort Carson growth from transportation and infrastructure projects to 
um, school projects, a lot of work done at the state level too in terms of support for service members, veterans and family members, and just the broad range of issues that regional partners and the state have done to really look to support the military in this community. So what we have done through the growth planning process is several stages of research analysis, more diving into details in terms of the demographic analysis of who's coming, when are they coming, what are the impacts of them coming, do they have small children needing child care, is the housing appropriate and at the right price for those soldiers and family members, and all of that demographic and analysis and how that led into the different issue areas. We initially looked at 12 different issue areas, and um, over the course of the, the grant process, six plus years have handed off that, and so this report really talks about what we've continued to do, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of that regional data analysis and providing good information and good planning information to our regional partners, working with Fort Carson, as well as um, now handing off a lot of those issue areas to to regional entities that can sustain the military community partnership. So that's kind of the Reader's Digest version. We did a lot around regional communication and coordination. We just had uh, our last town hall on the 30th of May. Commissioner Heisey prov provided that presentation, which is in your packet. Um, we've done newsletters and website updates. The, the last newsletter is also in your packet. And then... Um, as we transition, one of the big things, as Rob mentioned, is the Peak Military Care Network. And that is really, we are now funded through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and a lot of local match partners to look at a, a, a more coordinated, coordinated way of assisting service members, veterans, and family members working with all the military installations in this community, the VA, and community-based providers to make sure that we're all working together and that we're sharing information and trying to fill any gaps and not duplicate services and make sure that we're all up to speed on military community uh, or uh, military and veteran culture and working really toward uh, more coordinated efforts. So a lot of the other handoffs we've talked about in the report, I'd happy to answer any questions, but that's sort of the, the, the very Reader's Digest version of where we've been over <laughs> the past six years. Um, I have more network of care brochures in case you need more. I always have them. You know that. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I just have to pass them around because I can. Um, <laughs> if you bring me a pile back, I'll understand. Um, but really, that's information is I keep those in my car because I run into people all the time who are looking for information. And that's what we're trying to do is make sure people get information and access to resources as quickly as possible. So that is the short version. The, uh, the report is here for approval so that we can submit that to OEA as our deliverable and finish off this uh, growth plan report over the past several years. So that's – I'll stop there and let you guys – So, Kate, there so. has been some – interest from the private sector in, in uh, keeping the town halls going, so we probably should talk about that sometime. But okay. So because if we can kind find of, the resources to do kind it. Kind of semi-officially, um, money has run out for, for that, so um, happy to talk to you about that. Okay. <laughs> Clerk and Recorder Williams. Yeah, if we can get a bunch of those, we can put those in our offices. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. If we could get some. Okay. We'll get some. I'll bring down a box. <laughs> okay. I will do that shortly. Yes. Commissioner um, Clark. I, um, I guess I'm kind of wondering, obviously this has been really important, and especially as we see the, the potential reduction of troops, too, that we need to keep a close eye on this. So I guess I'm wondering, um, are there other – Grant opportunities um, potentially from a private, from more of a nonprofit status um, or stance to figuring out if there's a way to keep this going. Um, and I, I share um, our chair's um, desire to keep the town halls active too. I, I don't know that it takes a lot of money to hold a town hall meeting if we have a free location for the, the, the town hall, and, and obviously there was a lot of interest at the last town hall, so that hasn't gone away, um, especially as we look at the um, continuing efforts that um, we need to make to keep track of the, the DOD and sequestration and the things that are happening today. So, Kate, do you, have you explored any other opportunities, and are there... Does it leave plans? The town halls? Well, not just the town halls, but to keep the growth plan process going on, because I think we need to be aware of what's happening um, from a financial and economic standpoint here. Two pieces on that. One, we have sort of um, 
institutionalized military community partnering more than it ever was five or six years ago across a broad range of folks. In terms of the town hall and the regional data that we do, and I can let Rob speak to this too, but we have um, Tom Miller, who has been the, our, our data analysis and GIS guy who was working part-time for transportation and for the military impact program as full-time transportation, but he has the capacity and the resources as long as we can access to good information to be able to track, um, again, that growth, those changes, and work, we can work with other entities like the Regional Business Alliance to be tracking those pieces. There's a lot of moving, still a lot of influx and a lot of uncertainty about what those changes are going to mean as, as long as we can continue to, you know, do those growth, plan, growth charts and analysis in terms of what we expect the numbers to be, um, it, as long as we have the resources or PPACG has the resources to, to do that, I think we'll continue to do that regional data analysis. Um, and we can certainly talk about how to reconfigure that town hall um, event so that there is an opportunity. We'd have to talk to Fort Carson about how to do that uh, as well, too. So I think that's something, a conversation we can have. But I would defer to Rob in terms of any more specifics on that. Well, and Rob, I'd, I'd like you to kind of put your thinking cap on and, and figure out if we need to figure <coughs> out how to come up with a little more dollars to be able to continue to monitor the Fort Carson growth and, and keep that dialogue going because we can't just let it drop just because we're done with the growth plan and we'll stick it on a shelf and we're we're done here we're not we need to figure out how to keep that moving down the road sure uh, the current plan now is to bring before the board in our budget drafts in the fall in a couple months to how to continue the military planning function if the board wants to do that so thinking caps are on trying to figure out not really growth plan efforts more implementation as Kate has said for a few months We've done as much planning as we can do physically for Fort Carson growth. It's all those things we've spun off to other community groups to keep those going. But the data collection and other things we'll still do. We'll introduce the topic of broadening it. Uh, later on your agenda, we're going to talk about military impact on the, at this board level. They're already at your committee levels. Uh, part of what you just approved was the Air Force getting on the Transportation Committee. And so I think everyone is there. So we want to broaden it not just to Fort Carson, but to all the military impacts to the region and how that's done because we have the alliance and the, the MAC, and Jim represents them. Whether they change or not or what their mission is going to be, how that interacts with all of your local government efforts, the business community efforts, and certainly the Council of the Governments. So we're, we're, we're already working on trying to figure out how to put that into our program. At a minimum, and Kate's exactly right, our transportation planning program looks at data, looks at growth for the next 25, 30 years, and that includes the military, all the bases. And so that's already embedded in what we do. We're, we're going to explore how do we do more of those things? But we don't want to do duplicate what the local government's doing or the chamber is doing or, I'm sorry, the alliance is doing and some of the other folks. Well, I, I think if I might, Mr. Chair, just um, I, at least this commissioner believes that from a military perspective, we need to look at all the installations here, not just Fort Carson. Um, although Fort Carson has very unique needs that um, many are, are much more human services related to, and, and that's part of what PPACG does as well with uh, some of the other agencies that, that, are, that are under us. So um, I just, I think we need to figure out, and I'm glad that you're, I'm glad that you're looking at that um, because it, it, it is going to have a major impact on our economy. No doubt. Yeah. Mayor Turley, and, and then we'll go to Clerk and Recorder Williams. Yeah, just a, a quick comment and, and going through the executive summary and the um, nothing for change, but, you know, it's, it's for example, the, the graphic on uh, page 5 and the charts shows, um, you know, El Paso County. I just want to, for the record, make a statement, you know, with the folks that we have in Teller County and Woodland Park, um, we're, we're pretty... Oh, we have quite a few folks up there. I don't know the exact number, but, um, I mean, just last night, I, I, I'm very involved with youth baseball in Woodland Park, and one of our coaches is a soldier at Fort Carson, and his sons live up there and play, and we have quite a few of those folks uh, in Woodland Park and out in Divide and I'm sure other parts of the county, too. So, you know, we, we, we work real hard um, uh, with Fort Carson and, and – when they're doing uh, orientation events and things to make sure that they know uh, where we're at and what we have to offer. And, 
And it's, it's, it's kind of a unique thing. And there's a lot of soldiers that come that like that small town atmosphere, um, literally less atmosphere, that we have in Woodland Park. <laughs> so, <laughs> are you talking about that thick air you got down there in Woodland Park? And my apologies for uh, not including that in the executive summary, but the full report does have maps and information on all four counties that were touched by the growth plan: El Paso, Teller, Fremont, and Pueblo. So that is all in there, and that, uh, that's the map. And I, I suspect that the Woodland Park offers one of the few environments, mountain environments, where, where a soldier could be stationed and actually live in the mountains. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. probably have some folks taking advantage of that. Clerk and Recorder Williams. Move approval of item 6A. Second. Any further discussion? Yes, Council Member Knight. <laughs> I know you guys have done a lot of great work over the six years, and this is a transition to pass it off to civilian entities, but I have big heartburn here that uh, Appendix D to the plan is a peak alliance for sustainability future. Um, I mean, we talked about that at the last meeting. We tabled it because uh, it was the time of the fire and very little county representation, but as the city, we had a chance to look at that. Um, there's, there's a lot more in there than just, you know, picking up the, the help to Fort Carson. There's a lot of goals and objectives in there. By 2030, the city or the county or the region will have some goals that, uh, you know, are financially unconstrained and uh, so f probably physically unrealistic. Uh, and so approving the... Uh, Approving the minutes if, or the plan if we are, in essence, also approving and giving credence to the full up sustainable peaks alliance for sustainability future master plan for 2030, I, I can't support this. Uh, we're just, you know, it's, it looks to be, I'm sure it wasn't no malice intended, but it looks to be a backdoor attempt to, uh, to get that sanctioned by this group without a full uh, hearing and uh, be able to, to cuss and discuss uh, the pros and cons of that. If I could address that briefly, that what this report really does is say this is a transition to, it's not the PPACG product at this point, it's transitioning to a community entity. And it's that the community entity is to work with all of the local governments and regional entities to figure out what the next steps are. I could probably let Rich talk more detail about what the specific plans are, but really this is about some work that was done around how does the regionally it support it, and then it's a transition piece. So the issues about what was in that plan and the next steps and PPACG's role in that is really not part of this project. I think that was tabled for the next month or the month after. So that's, that's, that would be the difference, and I don't know if that causes you know, any less concern for you now, but I just wanted to explain the difference being that it's really about transitioning it to another, the same way that we're transitioning excuse me, transitioning the, the uh, peak military care network and um, Alliance for Kids working on um, child care issues and those sorts of things. So it's really, this is what we've done so far and we're moving it forward. Um, we haven't, uh, I haven't had can, it. Can continue on. With, um, uh, you know, and I apologize, I just with council meetings this week and everything else, we haven't, I haven't had a chance to, to go through all four appendixes. You know, I went through the main thing, but all four appendixes. So I don't know if you're including it as reference material only or if you're including it as uh, as an endorsement and this is the the path of the future. Because if it's the latter, then then no, that doesn't put my fears aside. Council <laughs> Member Pico? Well, I'm going to echo that. There, there are things, you know, I did read that particular Appendix D in, in uh, considerable depth, and there are things that I will not only never support, but I will actively oppose, you know, un until they, until you bury me. Um, so there's that concern is that if, if we're approving this transition plan, that we are not by any stretch adding a support to that particular uh, 2030 plan. That that's my, that's my concern. It's, that's not in the recommendations. It's really a matter of it would be the Peak Alliance for Sustainable Future to take on this issue in the future. So well, see, that's, that's, yeah, that's who okay. I don't want to take any part of a transition plan because the, pro the product that they produce is something I absolutely cannot support and will oppose. That, that's my concern. Bob, did you have a comment before we go? Yeah, uh, just to be clear, the, the reference, uh, and Kate was right, the, the – 
piece of that report in the appendix is already transitioned. The, the March 12 version of that report is not owned by anyone but the Alliance. They may have changed their name. So the Alliance is a separate entity. Call it School District 11. If you have comments, direct them to them for their plan, because they're the only ones that have adopted that plan. That plan was spun off, or the, that plan was part of the Fort Carson Growth Plan, but it was spun off to that separate group. Like Kate said, to the Alliance for Kids, this board doesn't endorse what the Alliance for Kids does with their efforts that were spun off from the Fort Carson Regional Growth Plan or the security or the school districts or any of the other health care things. You know, Peak Military Care Network is now with the National Homeland Defense Foundation. So that's, that's in the report, too, that's been spun off to another entity. So it's not our report anymore. So. The Alliance has a report. If you have comments on the Alliance, and if the Alliance comes to Colorado Springs, El Paso County, whoever they go to, you can talk to them if they have any requests of any of you or the business community or the nonprofits or Fort Carson, anyone that's doing something sustainable, the Alliance has taken the lead on that effort. So your acceptance of this transition report doesn't bind you to every and any transition that we've done from this effort out to the community side. So I hope that that makes sense. Clerk and Recorder Williams. I, I was just going to suggest as, as if, and I forget who seconded the motion, uh, just as a clarification that the approval of the uh, transition report does not uh, necessitate an approval of any of the accompanying appendices. And I think that addresses hopefully the concerns. Does secondary agree? Yeah, I think Sally and I were oh. kind of doing the same yeah, time. I don't know. But I, 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 if I'm the seconder, I would certainly accept that. Council Member Joel, yeah. <laughs> your, your last name suddenly escaped me. I, I just, uh, you know, want a clarification because in Appendix C of the Growth Plan Summary of Recommendations, it does specifically say that um, to be working with the the community to adopt and implement the goals of the strategies. And uh, uh, in the PPR 2030, well, again, the concerns we have is also the, the Colorado Springs Utilities Board. When you see 50 percent renewables by 2030, that has a very direct impact. On, and there's no, there's no funding. It doesn't say with, because our current energy vision says to attempt to achieve a certain amount with cost goals, you know, sort of bounding the uh, capability of doing that. So to see that and then coupled with transportation saying, um, you know, fuel of transportation would be 50 percent renewables by 2030. I just think there's some goals in there which I think would be great goals, but they're not offset by any economic factors. It's just we're going to pursue this at all costs. And I think Fort Carson pursuing it has a direct effect on utilities as well. And so from the utilities board standpoint, I would need to see some sort of bounding of that because there, there is, in order for Fort Carson to meet those goals, and we've run into this, it's sort of, it's not just Fort Carson saying this is our goal. It then applies pressure to utilities to make changes to our, uh, uh, to our platform and what we're able to offer, which affects all ratepayers. So, and I would say that ultimately. Any of those goals and any of these implementation pieces are really up to who is that leading entity. Is it for Carson? Is it Spring Utility? I don't think PPACG or the Growth Plan or Peak Alliance would be able to dictate or mandate to Black Hills Energy or to Springs Utilities or to PPACG's transportation program or any program. This is what you're required to do. That was never the intent, and, and hopefully that would never be the intent, but to say that this is – um, is this something that which should be pursued, and if so, how? So, and again, that at this point is now outside of the purview of the growth plan, but up to the communities and the partners involved in the um, in the sustainability efforts to do that. So, um, there was never an intent to say this has to be done by a certain time. It isn't fiscally it's constrained. It isn't. It's, again, it was done as could this as a region be something a goal to strive toward? And again, I would defer to you know Richard others who have been more involved on the sustainability side of the equation. I've been more on the peak military care network side of the equation. So, but um, I. Again, there was never the intent that this would dictate to any particular entity, you know, the City of Fountain, City of Manitou, El Paso County, that this is a requirement. 
it was let me to let me go to Commissioner Steen, and then we're going to go back to Clerk and Recorder Williams to restate his motion because we've we've gotten away from the uh, the item in front of us, and we're debating the uh, the goals and and two separate items there. Uh, so, yeah, I, I share Colorado Springs' uh, concern about the Appendix D, uh, especially the transportation energy goals. And I would I would just suggest that not. Not only do we not uh, endorse a direct, or not, not uh, specify directive language because the 23rd plan does not, it does specify this is non-directive, but we also withhold any type of endorsement of it because I, I share a similar concern not only for Colorado Springs Utilities, but 50% um, renewables on all transportation sources is, I mean, it's, it's beyond imagination. I would even, even get there scientifically, much less financially, so. Short comment, Dr. Null. Uh, I would just uh, add to this general discussion something for your consideration, and that is <clears throat> it seems to me that like entities did and maybe still do in visiting the bases, we ought to have the general or his appointee come and talk about the transition to this group. I know we're looking at what we've been doing, but this is one chance for them to get to interact with all the entities in the community. And, uh, and so that if there are areas of misunderstanding or things that are happening, um, they can come out then or, or not. But it seems to me to just to prove um, that we're going to go on with this plan, this is an opportunity to make sure that we've got a conversation going between Pikes Peak Area Council governments, as well as those for the individuals, which I assume will still be on at the various bases. Uh, but that way we may not be jumping to conclusions that aren't really going to happen or mean something. It also gives you a chance to weigh in whoever is sent to give the presentation, any concerns you have. Just might consider that. I don't know. I think that was part of the reasoning behind um, looking to changing the bylaws to include uh, military leadership representation on the PPACG board so that that could be an ongoing discussion, not about this topic, but about any topic as the military does, institutions but include. I think there's but nothing like having the top guy or his <coughs> need talk about the future of the bases, or in this case, Fort Carson uh, in general. That it's a good thing to do. So, Wayne, if you could restate your motion as it applies to approving the Fort Carson Regional Growth Plan Implementation Status Report. <laughs> well, I had a quick question. If Because the bottom says resolve the transition report, but the title says implementation status report. So. Uh, my apologies. It should say transition report. Okay. I just wanted to be clear. I it was a cut and paste so error. Uh, a cut and paste error. I apologize. Six A as opposed to a title. So, uh, thank you. So the correct term is Fort Carson Regional Growth Plan Transition Report. Okay, which is the top line, not the recommendation line. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Making sure. Okay. Uh, the motion is to approve the Fort Carson Regional Growth Plan Transition Report uh, with a specific note that this does not imply approval of the appendices and um, let me get the specific wording this refers to them as um, So the attachments to it are called appendices. Supports and appendices. Find it. Um. Yeah, which document are we? There's quite a few. It's not on the agenda packet. Let's see. If I might, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I I just like to know too. It, I think it might be helpful for us out of at our next meeting to take a look at the concerns that have been brought up today specifically and provide some feedback because it's great to oppose whatever it is but if we don't provide some meaningful feedback to the entities who will have control over this then 
we really aren't making any impact in that area. So um, I, I just, I think, um, even though this today is, is just the report and the resolution that's fairly benign, um, I, again, I don't think we want to just give tacit approval or to give the impression that we're endorsing something that others aren't comfortable with. So I'd like to get some more specifics about portions of, of what have been brought up today. And then I think this board could, could take the um, initiative and write a letter and, and provide some input to that, to those components that we're uncomfortable with. We'll, we will discuss that further offline. Um, I understand there was some discussion about that last month when we were not here. We weren't here. Yes. Uh, to, to clarify, Let, the let's, I just want to clarify what the appendices were. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd like to. Sure. Append there are four appendices. Appendix, four. appendix A is um, the, the newsletters since the last growth plan report, so um, just to updates on what the growth plan has been doing. Appendix B is maps, more detailed maps, GIS maps related to um, Fort Carson impacts in the community, that number of veterans in El Paso County and the other counties. Um, Appendix C is the amalgamation of growth plan recommendations across the six plus years of the report. And Appendix D is the Peak Alliance for Sustainable Future Business Plan. Okay. So it's Appendices C and D that there are issues with? Is that? Or is that? I'll defer to Mr. Well, and to me, Were Appendix C refers to D right. in the right. goals. So. Right. So I'm just checking A and B. I don't have any issues. Right. Okay. So uh, I would move we approve the Fort Carson Regional Growth Plan Transition Report uh, with a specific acknowledgement that this approval of the report does not infer or imply approval of either Appendix C or Appendix D. Any further comments on the motion on the table? Council Member Knight. Mr. McDonald said, I mean, there's a lot of different people that are alliances that are spun off from this and marching forward. You know, the kids that work for care, none of them are highlighted with their own separate appendices. I mean, the recommendations, if, if we go with what uh, the clerk and the court said on that note for C, but I just assume have D. I don't see why that one is more than compared to any of the other uh, alliances that have spun off. <laughs> If I, those were addressed in early reports and were spun off earlier, so the implementation status report that was adopted a year ago had the appendices that talked about the peak military care network um, and others. And so Alliance for Kids is an entity that's been in existence for a long time. There's a, a military community law enforcement collaborative that's an informal group, so it depends on what the issue is. So there have been appendices related to other pieces, and so those are in all the growth plan. I didn't include the six years of documents. They are available online on our website, but just to clarify that, so those pieces have been addressed in other ways. I think that this one was included because it was an update. There were changes to it that did include actually some other pieces that were removed. So that, that's why it was there was an update to it, and that's why it was included. Mayor Schneider. There, so. uh, I just want to clarify that, that we don't have that before us, though, on this agenda. The Peak Alliance has pulled that, that collaboration that we postponed last month, right. and they'll be coming back in the future. So we'll have an opportunity to discuss that. It, it was just a collaboration, no fiscal impact. Right. They, they were here to provide an update of their mm -hmm. efforts or are, are now external to PPACG. So they may or may not come back in the future. They may come back with a different request. But they're not coming back to ask this board to accept their already adopted plan that was done in March 2012. So they don't, my understanding is they don't want your approval of their year and a half old plan. So that was where they were last month. They're not there anymore. And, um, but, but that's where they are now, and so. So, they, so back to the motion on the on the floor. Right, you're there. One, one little okay. comment <laughs> there is that you know Manitou was proud to, to make a small donation to the alliance. We support sustainability, and uh, I understand all your concerns. I don't see how adopting this plan requires anything of any entity, including utilities, to do anything. 
Okay, I, I, so I think we'll have an opportunity down the road if, if the sustainability is something that you know you guys have a real problem with. I think we should take that up and and down the road and decide as a board how we want to interact, if at all, with the sustainability alliance. But um, I I uh, would second Commissioner Williams or Clerk Williams' motion. I don't know if we got that officially done or not, and call we, the question. We've. Uh, we were asking him to restate it, so he'd already made the motion. Mayor Easton? I was going to second the motion and encourage that offline discussion, and we can move on to make sure our colleagues are taken care of and those concerns are addressed. But I want to second the motion and move forward. Final comment before we vote? Call the roll. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries with Council Member Knight voting no. Got that, Jacqueline? Thank you. Thank you. I'll bring more brochures down, though. <laughs> 6B, El Paso County Municipal Representative to the Metro Roundtable. Rich, do you have this yeah. one? The action requested from the board this morning is to elect uh, Mark Pfeiffer to serve as the El Paso County Municipal Rep to the uh, Metro Roundtable. The Denver Metro Roundtable includes a small portion of El Paso County and is actually one of nine basin roundtables which uh, represent each of the eight states' um, major river basins. So there's eight ma major river basins re represented, and then the uh, ninth one is the Denver Metro Roundtable. These were created through a House Bill um, 051177, which is also known as the uh, Colorado Water for the 21st Century Act. And these roundtables essentially discussed water management issues and um, were, were developed to go ahead and produce uh, reports that study the c consumptive and the non-consumptive needs of each of those um, roundtable areas uh, through 2030. And these roundtables include representatives from the, the, the counties in, in, uh, in which uh, the boundaries are set and also um, representatives for the, the, the cities, um, kind of one city represented for all, all the counties. Um, and with that, Mark has been involved as a Arkansas River Basin um, roundtable rep. He's manages the SDS uh, uh, pipeline for CSU. Um, he's actually a former director of uh, Carlisle Department of Public Health and Environment Water Quality Control Division. Um, and he's actually serves as a representative to the Colorado Water Quality Control Commission for our area. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions? I do. <laughs> Commissioner Clark? Um, you didn't, we didn't get a list of who's already on the round table. Um, other than obviously our vacancy that's for our county, who else is, is on there? Really? On the on the on the, big, on on the, the Denver on Metro the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're really. Um, I think I'm trying to remember who represents El Paso County, but because El Paso County is just a small um, portion of the of Denver me, uh, Metro Roundtable, there's just two reps from our one from El Paso County. And I guess I'm just wondering who else is. on Committee, um, yeah, and, and I'm not sure. I mean, all, all the other folks that re represent um, the, the cities and, and the counties in the D Denver metro area, and there's re representatives from ag, uh, representatives from, from the Colorado Water, Big Water Conservation. There's, there's, over, there's over 30. Okay. We, we can email that out to the rep board. Re representatives, I, I, yeah. I don't know if the whole board wants it. I'm just interested as who's on there. Right. Yeah, there's a, each each of those roundtables has a list of uh, of the representatives. So that that'll be easy enough to get to. Okay. Councilmember Miller. I just wanted to, according to the letter, there it says um, that there since since it was established, there has been no official El Paso County municipal representative, and I think that was one of the things they were trying to. You know, I was. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what the letter that's has in it. Is it? I, I was kind of hoping Wayne would be here because I thought we had this discussion about the time it was formed, and I thought we actually had a representative. It might have been for the Arkansas River Basin. Oh, it, we, it, it, it was for the Denver. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. No one's been willing to go ahead and, and, and serve. That's my, my understanding. No one's been willing to take, take that role on okay. uh, in, in, until now. So. All right. 
or are we just it, it, we do have just a small portion of the county that and the, yeah that's that just it. I mean, it's something it's, up in the Palmer Lake area. Don't know. I don't remember no just how that works. <laughs> do we have a motion to approve? Move approval. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. 6C, Board Bylaws Change Proposal. Rob? I got that one. Um, as was alluded to in Kate's report, uh, a specific recommendation out of the Fort Carson Growth Plan was for the board to consider additional membership or how to deal with all the military bases. Uh, in your bylaws now, you have obviously uh, the MAC representative. And when we looked at the bylaws, we even found that they weren't really even supposed to have an alternate, but we haven't really enforced that uh, particular bylaw condition. But we thought staff-wise, uh, again, this was on your agenda last month. We, we pushed it to this month because we had a lot of folks out. Uh, the request today is for the board to give direction. Uh, and in the memo, it talks about either no action, uh, have staff go look at the bylaws, come back with proposed motion, have your executive committee, which are the officers plus myself, or another subcommittee of this board to look at the bylaws to see if you want to add specifically military representatives or look at some of the other things. Uh, right now you have an air quality uh, commission representative, but you do not have a water quality representative from the state. So we would think you could look at that too if you wanted to look at that or any of the others. Uh, also talks about in the memo uh, future regulations from federal transportation we think will require some sort of voting presence by the uh, area transit provider. Now we have two here. One is Mountain Metro Transit from City Car Springs. The other is in the City of Fountain. And the federal law is not clear yet. They haven't adopted. Does it have to be the operator of transit? Does it have to be, I think the only thing they've said for certain is not an elected official, which opens it to whomever would come to represent public transportation. Wait, so, which is something of a problem for this board because this board in the past has said only elected officials right. can yeah. vote. And, and so because the feds haven't come down with the definitive law yet, everyone across the country has That's different right. ways of doing it. Uh, the way this board has done public transportation uh, tie-in to this board action is before the change of government in City Car Springs, the three city council members really control the budget and actions of the city transit. So they are voting members on this board. Now going to a strong mayor form of government, the strong mayor has more of an oversight of the transit uh, group and staffing. So if the board wants to look at the bylaws, we would suggest looking at ways to deal with that possible future federal uh, requirement because they like to tie it to their transportation funds. Again, they don't have specifics of it has to be whoever. It could be a staffer. It could be not. We don't know. But if the board wanted to look at that, we could look at that as well. It could bring back possible options for the board to consider. None of these is really urgent. It's not tying up any other processes we have here. But because the specific recommendation out of the Four Cars and Growth Plan we thought we'd ask the board, do you want to do anything with your bylaws on membership or not? If so, how do you want to proceed? Commissioner Dwalaby. Your, your uh, point on the elected officials, Dennis, the, mm -hmm. do, do you, Rob, do you have like some light to shed on, on the thought you. process beside <clears throat> of only elected officials voting? I mean, is it, is it, is there a reason that was in the bylaws in the first place? It, it was a before my time issue, but I was here for a, for a discussion one one point in the past where uh, where that status was maintained. And, and it's your bylaws. You have different memberships, voting and non-voting. That's all spelled out in your bylaws. So this board obviously has non-voting members that are not elected officials, but voting members right now are all elected officials. That's Do you have an answer as to the why, why that may have come about? Um, uh, ego? I, <laughs> in, the, in the 46 years we've been around, I think it came from 
you're, you're the local governments that pay the dues based on assessed value. It hits your budgets directly. So that's my sense of why it was elected officials, that when you set the dues for all the local governments, it's elected leaders of those local governments imposing a, a fee on yourselves, not non-voting, non-elected folks that would do that. But again, it's 46 years of history, but I think the direction, you are the member governments, you are the leaders of those local governments, and those are elected officials. So I think that's where it came from. Thank you. Council Member Pico and then Commissioner Clark. Yeah, I, I think the principle of, of keeping the voting members to the elected officials uh, goes down to the single word of accountability as opposed to eagle, you know. Uh, Poor Jeff. But the <laughs> – humorously noted. But the, <laughs> but the points that uh, made by uh, Mr. McDonald are, are exactly on point. It's, it's the accountability of those who have, are responsible for the budget and everything else. So if we start packing the board with voting members who are not accountable – then you lose control pretty quickly about where this where the body is going, and so uh, we want to add a couple of advisory members who don't vote. You know, we can talk about that, but if we want to expand that to uh, people who are not elected, not accountable, uh, then uh, yeah, I think that's not a not a good way to go. Commissioner Clark, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of questions, and and I, I I do think it's accountability. It doesn't it. it requires us to not just sit on the sidelines and not get involved. It requires involvement from the elected officials, which I think is extremely important. And once you start to delegate your authority and your accountability off, it's hard to get it back again. And so I, I think it's a good it's a good thing. The question I have for Rob is how does Dr how is Dr. Cog responding to this in terms of the trans or the uh, the transportation piece do we have specific language yet from the feds that's going to require this? And that I think we need to look at. And, uh, and where's that flexibility for us to figure out who represents the, um, that, that transit sort of piece? Um, it seems to me the council members from the city of Colorado Springs who really operate Mountain Metro and, and those in Fountain that ultimately maybe have oversight or accountability back to their citizens uh, could serve in that capacity or dual capacity on this board. Uh, so sometimes I guess my frustration with the feds is is they'll say they have these regulations, but then they don't, they do leave flexibility in it. You know, FEMA is a pretty good example of we really don't have a threshold, but we we really would like you to meet this threshold. And so it, it's, that's what I'm asking. Where's the specifics from the Fed saying that we have to have somebody who's not an elected official? Uh, it's in draft language, so it's not definitive. We're not there yet. We're far from there. Okay. Uh, the federal transportation law will likely expire before they come out with the rules and regulations. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. so, so really we don't need to worry about this right now? Right. And, and as I said, it's not urgent on this. But our thought was if the board wants to open up their bylaws, look at membership, voting or non, we can throw that into the discussion as well because there's probably a hundred different examples of how metropolitan planning organizations do that over, over the country. And for Dr. Cog, RTD is that agency. They're a separate agency. They're not city and county of Denver. They're RTD. And I'd, I'll check with Craig if you know offhand if RTD has a voting membership on Dr. Cog board. He's shaking his head yes. So they're not mandated to do that, but they have chosen to do that as a board. Well, I think just keeping an eye on it is fine. I, I don't think we need to need your do anything obviously at this point and who knows how long those regulations <laughs> will take. Um, one of the things I wanted to also mention, the military piece I think is is, is a good idea to look at expanding that. I, I would like us to approach the various installations and see how they feel about having a direct member or whether they would rather get together between them and choose somebody else um, to serve to represent all. Um, rather than to have to have one for every for every base and or the post, so um, that would be my take on it. Okay. I just reporter. want to make sure if they take it on that they're going to actually be here because that's that has been a problem um, even with uh, um, 
even with the chamber slash regional business alliance representation, we haven't always had somebody like um, Colonel Moore here who's been here pretty regularly, but it has been problematic of not actually having someone at the table even though they're appointed. Clerk and Recorder Williamson will go to Colonel Moore. Okay, thanks. Uh, first, RTD is a very different circumstance because RTD has an elected board. And so they are not a group of just a bureaucracy that has no accountable elected officials. They actually have elections for RTD director. Uh, and so the reason they would have a separate representation on Dr. Cog is they're actually a separate political entity. They have their own taxing district. They have a whole host of things. So it's a very different circumstance. Um, the decisions made at this board level, whether it involves approval of a sewer plant, whether it involves uh, ranking of transportation projects, um, those decisions, whether it involves whether you have to get, and most of you weren't on the board when we did this, whether you have to get an emission for your test for your car. Uh, those are decisions made by this board, and those decisions ought to be made by people who are accountable to the voters. And if the voters don't like those decisions, they then have the ability to go through the constitutionally provided recall procedures. Uh, it's happened with school boards and special districts. Uh, there are a couple commissioners 12 years ago that people wanted to recall. It's happening now with a state senator. So there, there, there's a procedure in Colorado law that is very different. Whereas if I don't like a bureaucrat's decision as a constituent, I can't do anything about it. Uh, and, and so I feel strongly, as someone who's been on this board for 11 years, Eight years as a regular voting member. <laughs> for the last three, is sometimes a voting member, depending on whether the regular members for the county show up, but always as, an, as a uh, non-voting member as your representative on stack. So I've been in both situations, as has former Councilman Noel here. Uh, and Jim and I in our other roles get to give input, but ultimately it should be the people who are elected by the people who get to make the decisions on this board. And I feel very strongly about that. Uh, it's not for ego because I no longer am one of those people except <laughs> today because Daryl's not here. <laughs> uh, and those decisions are important. Now, having said that, if the feds do something, then we'll have to look at it. But I certainly don't think we ought to start adopting regulations based on the possibility the feds may or may not adopt something <laughs> in the future. Uh, and so I, I guess my thought is that until someone comes forward and says, I want to do this, I don't know how aggressively we ought to pursue at all changing the current bylaws. Uh, I think as members of the public, anyone can attend and, and provide input. Um, on items that are on the agenda, if we get someone from one of the bases that wants to play a more active role than is currently being played, I'd welcome them. But ultimately, they ought to be an advisory member who can speak and say things, but ultimately the elected officials who are responsible to the voters should make the decisions. And beyond the work of a recall, the citizen always has the option of waiting till the next election. That's right. <laughs> and many of the people here have had people run against them and, 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 or have run against <laughs> someone who was on this board at one point. Uh, and, and so <laughs> that election process is the way for the people to make the decisions. And if, if we have to have someone who if we're going to tell you you got to pay $20 every year because you got an old car, uh, then that ought to be a decision by elected officials. If we're saying we're going to do Cimarron and not Powers, that ought to be a decision by elected officials. Mr. Chair, can I make a clarification on the military side? Is sure. That what? They would need to be <laughs> they would need to be non-voting members anyway. They wouldn't be able to be part of a decision-making process. Okay. They would need to be advisory only. So that was just to clarify that. Thanks, Colonel Moore. Well, uh, 
She just took care of one of my observations. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, as a general over, overview, I think, uh, from my own experience, uh, a review of bylaws as a routine organizational uh, activity, I think, is worthwhile. Uh, and that's what I understand is, is really the question before. There's a number of recommendations in here, but am I wrong? There is a recommendation to go back and look at the bylaws if they are meeting the needs of the organization at this time. Is that? The, the request is, does the board even want to do that? Well, if so, yeah. here are certain things. You're right. I mean, it's, it's healthy to do that now and again. The one specific recommendation from the growth plan, that was the impetus to say, that would require a bylaw change. So if you are going to do a bylaw change, is that the specific thing you want to look at, or do you want to look broader? And there's a few things we suggested. So that, and that was my understanding. But I, I think as a general rule, you know, looking at the bylaws every three or four years or something is well worthwhile simply because things change in the environment you're trying to operate in. Um, second to um, Ms. Hatton's observation, uh, I don't see any way you could have sitting, serving military officers uh, in a voting position in a political organization. So I think however you decide to proceed with that aspect of it, um, not voting <coughs> would be the only course of action from my experience. Finally, uh, and this is to Commissioner Clark's uh, uh, comment, there is an organization that meets regularly that's called the Area Chiefs of Staff. Uh, it is a group that meets under the auspices of the Regional Business Alliance, and I think it might be worth uh, approaching Andy Merritt over at the, at the Alliance to see whether that is a vehicle for getting the kind of counsel, whether the chief, area chiefs of staff would want to appoint a representative, as Commissioner Clark suggested, or whether that's a starting place for this kind of conversation about how you could have a more active voice from the serving military personnel. Um, the MAC, frankly, tries to be in a position and it is focusing its current efforts on trying to be in a position of leveraging both sides of the equation between the military organizations and the community. What needs are there are the military organizations the community can try to serve, and what needs are there that the community has that we can find some partnerships in and try to um, facilitate improving in those areas. So we're not really in a position to be the voice for the sitting, the serving uh, units in the area. Thank you. Council Member Knight. Yeah, the f four options presented, I would recommend option four of a subcommittee, uh, and that way you can invite the uh, military to come on in and, and be bar part of that committee. I mean, if we're going to go to all this work and m give them a non-voting seat and like to know that they do want a non-voting seat, and I appreciate that you guys recognize all five military installations here. Someone that did two years as in the support group of Shine Mountain, we didn't always feel as <laughs> that we were recognized as a separate military installation. But you know, the fact of life is both Peterson and, and uh, Shine Mountain fall under the same wing king, so that wing king might only want one rep here. He might like to have, hopefully he'd like to have two. But So I go with that subcommittee. Um, I recommend that uh, option four would be the, the right way to go so that we can open it up to the people that want to be uh, come on here versus just the uh, officials. Uh, second point, uh, going back to uh, voting members, one thing I did notice in the by bylaws, we have no formula uh, for you know how many of each municipality and elected officials are that we have in here. So, if the feds say that we have to have a transportation voting officer, then all of a sudden they're getting the same weight as a lot of our other members, and, and that's probably not fair. And if we had some sort of formula that said, okay, if you're Fed directed, you, you we can't give them a half a vote, but maybe we can increase the, you know, look at something to to dilute their weight uh, on, on the total vote count. Thank you. Dr. Noll. Somebody referred to my old age. No, how long I've been on here. <laughs> uh, I just caution you that the major change in this agency came when we took an administrative role, and which we now have uh, for the RTA. 
kind of situation. So I think you want to be really careful uh, about this board doesn't, uh, you don't have people <clears throat> somehow now getting votes that count and override other elected officials' votes so that they have to go back to their unit and say, we have at least five who are against this, or three against this. It's a very practical matter. You have a model here that's unusual across the country with this being both a planning agency and has an executive arm to a portion of the activities that occur in our region. And so in addition to the, um, the last say or the expenditures of the general funds of the cities or the counties, uh, you have this unique model. And I think you could upset the apple cart if you started uh, changing uh, membership on here in terms of, uh, of voting rights over not only now planning money, but implementation money as well. And so uh, I admire your move to add that component to this agency, and it may still be the only one in the country that does both kinds of things, and they do it well. And so I wouldn't, I'd be really careful about making any voting change requirements. Mr. Clark, I then just, I'd like to bring this to Right, and I just wondered, asking Rob, do we have a standing bylaws committee? No. Okay, because I, I think that that would be a better place to, rather than to sit around, and not that we shouldn't sit around and talk about this, it's important, but I think that that might be a good idea to just put a, a, a sort of a committee or subcommittee together right, so to, you're to, agreeing to with look at the, Knight. at the at the bylaws, yeah. So. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to serve on that committee. So, um, however, and I, I'd like kind of a timeline as to when we think we need to have, if we're going to do uh, informal committee, whoever wants to participate, um, when we think we would like to come back for changes to the board. This is listed as an action item. I'm kind of thinking we can handle this by consensus. Um, is there anyone that, that is opposed to the subcommittee approach? Mm -hmm. That being the case, uh, I'd like to seek self-nominations here. Who would be willing to work on, on the bylaws subcommittee? We have Commissioner Clark already, Councilmember Knight, Mayor Turley. Um, a few more would be good. Committee of three works, too. Right? As long as it's an odd number. <laughs> <laughs> but we're happy to invite anyone, so. Well, I think that's a good, that's a good, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> that, that seems like a good representation there. We it, the county, it does. The I'm city, just and a smaller community. And, mm -hmm. uh, Concerned, though, if, if one person can't make it, does that mean the committee can't meet? Where if, if we have, say, five and somebody can't make it, we still have I think we'll, a representation. We'll figure it out. I would think with three, they should be able to come up with some time that works mm -hmm. for three of them. And uh, I'd suggest that uh, in terms of a schedule, you know, since we are generally on a annual basis, uh, having them report back with draft uh, recommendations by our September meeting, uh, which gives them okay. a couple months to do that. And, and I'll be then, happy okay. to. If we need a chair, I'll chair it and work with Rob to get some meetings set up. And then, if, well, if and we'll let everyone know when we're holding meetings. So, if others would like to attend, they're welcome to we, join uh, in the fun. We have those those three members. We'll let you decide how you want to uh, handle the running of the meetings and when you meet and all those types of things. So, very good. That brings us to item number seven. Seven uh, A is the Air Force Partnership Initiatives. Good morning. And who My do we have here? I'm I'm Lynn Newman from Air Force Space Command. I feel very grateful to have been invited to um, provide some information on some collaborative initiatives that we have going on. Um, with the community. So to return the favor, uh, as we're prone to do in the Air Force, I'd like to subject you to a PowerPoint slide deck. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's see if I can figure this out. Figure it out. Okay, maybe we just need to. All right. 
and this, this really won't be too painful. It's mostly talking, but there are a couple of charts in here that will help me to articulate um, what it is we're doing. Thank you very much. All right, so we have um, two primary initiatives that we have um, begun um, in the last year. Um, and the first is um, named the Regional Encroachment Management Action Plan. It's a big mouthful, and we call it the REMAP for short. Um, the second is the Community Partnerships Initiative, which some of you may have also heard um, referred to as the Public 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 Private Partnerships, or P4. So I'm really happy that we've been able to change names. It makes it a lot, a lot easier on me. Um, but the um, the overall. Um, purpose of both of these initiatives is to work more collaboratively with our communities to um, do efficient business um, as military installations and as good um, community partners. Um, so we capitalize on the relationships that we already have um, and we try to foster additional relationships um, that help us to be good neighbors and good partners. All right, so the remap. Um, so this is a fancy slide um, that talks to what the term encroachment means. Um, and it's a really squirrely term. I'm not a big fan of it. I like the term compatible use. But basically, um, we are sharing resources um, with the community, and the community is sharing resources with us as military installations. And so how do we work together um, to sustain um, a great neighborhood, a great way of life, and also to sustain those military missions um, that we're here to do um, uh, to support national security. So um, to give you a little bit of a background, um, the Air Force embarked on um, the program Encroachment Management, um, which is also synonymous with sustainability, which I think is a little bit more common um, um, because we work so closely with Fort Carson in this community. Um, and the Air Force directed all installations to do an individual encroachment management action plan. It's an installation complex encroachment management action plan, ISMAP. Okay, so we went out and did these. And what we found in this area in particular, um, because we have um, several military installations, is we're always looking at the same things. And furthermore, we're always looking at the same resources and challenges that the community is looking at. Makes a lot of sense, right? And so um, because um, as Air Force Space Command, you know, we sit here on Peterson in a headquarters, um, but we happen to have four installations in this area uh, along the Front Range. And so we were able to leverage that and ask the Secretary of the Air Force to let us experiment um, in looking at these encroachment challenges regionally. Um, and so that's how we came up with the remap. So the remap covers the six installations um, along the the front range, um, you can see from the chart that there's a lot involved in these six installations. We've got MOAs and ranges, training routes, um, operational areas. Um, we take up a lot of space um, and we ask a lot um, and we give a lot economically um, to our communities. And so really what this remap is all about is looking at how to um, to manage those resources properly. So, sir. We just had a question. What's yes. a MOA? A MOA is a military operation area. area. Yes. You, you have a lot of uh, a lot of former so, military in here, but not all of us. Right. So, so <laughs> I apologize. I will try to break down my acronyms. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so please feel free to stop me. <laughs> I'll try not to talk in my own language here. Um, so the remap is all about looking at those regional challenges and working with um, the front range communities to manage those appropriately so that we can do our missions and we can also be good neighbors. So um, the topics of interest, having vetted this um, from, we started in December of last year. Um, and so we've gotten to almost a draft stage of what will become a final report. And the, um, the issues that rose to the top um, are not terribly surprising, um, but they're listed here, airspace, um, energy, um, compatibility and availability, spectrum, urban development growth, and water, um, which would include water quality, stormwater, water availability. Um, so here's what we've done so far on the remap. Um, back in uh, the previous fiscal year, um, 
I'm sorry, the beginning of this fiscal year, um, we talked with, um, we scoped the project and then came in December and talked with um, some of the senior leadership from the installations and said, what are your mission challenges? You know, what is it that comes up time and time again that you're always having to work on? And so we got a, a good preliminary um, perspective on what to focus on. Um, then we um, did some brainstorming and we brought in the subject matter experts um, from the installations and also the community. So um, many mem staff members um, uh, from the community participated with us and we, and we had great support and, and um, really appreciate that. Um, but we delve further into these areas and others, um, but as I said, the ones on the previous chart really bubbled up to the top. And we found out a lot of details. Um, and then we went back and we brainstormed and we made more phone calls and we did more research and Marcel Day, um, whom James um, uh, is employed by, um, has helped us with this. And so we've done a lot of work so far, and we've got some preliminary analysis. Um, in May, the Marcel Day team and I um, briefed um, the installation representatives again, and we got some input. And one of the biggest challenges of the remap is, well, how do we manage it? Because we're not just talking about Air Force Base Command. We're talking about also the academy that doesn't fall under Air Force Base Command. We're talking about Fort Carson. Um, and... We're talking about Buckley, uh, which is Air Force Base Command, but has a whole different you know, set of government partners um, than we do here in Colorado Springs. So that's a big challenge, um, and we're making some headway on that. Um, but in the end, uh, how we think it will go is that we'll capitalize on existing forums. Um, there's already a stormwater task force. There's a transportation advisory committee. There are all these forums in place to work um, these types of issues. Um, we, we're just trying to plug in at the right places and with the right level of military leadership. Um, so we expect um, Marcel Day to provide us with a written um, uh, draft um, toward the end of this month, and that it, then as we get toward the end of the summer into August, we will bring folks back together, um, the subject matter experts as well as some community leaders that we've been working with, um, the DMTF and um, uh, Business Alliance and so forth, and our installation commanders, and run those findings by them as well as how we'd like to manage them. So that's the synopsis of the remap. Um, are there any questions on that? Questions for Ms. Newman? Okay, maybe I missed it, but is the Air Force Academy included? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, then I did miss that. Okay. So, um, Commissioner Clark, you had made reference to um, including all of the DOD um, sort of growth and requirements and that kind of um, thing in one look. And this is a step toward that. Um, it doesn't um, meet the full need, um, but in terms of encroachment, um, this will accomplish um, looking at what the requirements are. So not so much the economic impact um, of you know, reductions in force that may be coming and so forth, but what are the existing requirements at this time that we need to do our mission, and how can we work with the community to, uh, to get those resources? Mr. Chairman, may I? Please. Um, I, I just wanted to um, mention, and I know that the county, um, gosh, what year was that? That was in probably 2005 when we first started talking with the, at that time, the uh, Economic Development Corporation working on the buffer zone at Fort Carson um, with the Nature Conservancy. And as a result, we have a one-and-a-half-mile buffer zone now that's been created, which was, I think, one of the first of its kind in the nation. But in addition to that, I think the military installations, too, need to make their elected officials who are dealing with planning and zoning and um, around our military uh, bases and the post to be aware of issues that impact them. And I know we've had those discussions at Shriver with regard to satellites and, and building heights and those kinds of things. So that dialogue, though, sometimes gets lost between changing commands over the years and somehow that needs to I think be something that's always at the forefront of us as elected officials and certainly our planning staff who um, helps us to write our various plans that that how development operates within those areas surrounding those installations. Yes, ma'am. So I just bring that up, and I don't know that you're going to be able to solve that, but take that back, if you can, to the various, to our, our military installations and to the leadership to let them know that that's an important piece of that. If we don't know it's in, encroaching and a problem, 
we can't fix it before it happens, and then it's after the fact. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so in terms of this remap, um, you know, the good news on that front is that this is um, a report that will be um, monitored at the secretariat level to see how we are managing these issues and how we're working with the community, so to keep some visibility on it. Um, but more importantly, I think this establishes some processes. And so um, I, I mentioned, you know, we're, um, the way we want to address these is to plug in um, at the right levels, to be more involved, um, to bring these things to the forefront and to keep um, a culture of um, awareness and visibility. Um, so I hope this will be a step in the right direction on that, and thank you for that input. Councilmember Brown. Um, what about the Pueblo Army Depot? Should this be part of it? Right. So we considered a lot um, of different scenarios. And we did look um, into Pueblo. Lynn, if I could ask you to speak into the mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I'm always hard to hear. <laughs> Just here we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and so um, in the end, um, we had to draw some boundaries. And so we looked at, you know, the different entities and what their challenges were and, and what um, the different entities, the installations have in common. And so we did end up drawing the line, um, you know, basically at Fort Carson and then up to Buckley. Um, to be quite honest, if we could do it again, I think we would leave Buckley out because there are so many complexities in working with an entirely different um, group of you know governing bodies there but this is a pilot project we're figuring out as we go there are going to be I think lots of advantages shown from just regional management in general um, but to answer your question you know in the end we just kind of had to draw a box and, and we stopped at Fort Carson yes, Colonel Moore just a quick question and I think uh, Commissioner Clark's hit on it but it occurs to me with the initiative to try to build traffic and build activity at the airport uh, are you all engaged in, or are representatives from Peterson engaged in those discussions to make sure you understand the impact on operations there as well as the increased aviation activity at uh, Carson? You know, I'm not the best to answer that. Um, because I sit at, at the headquarters as opposed to at Peterson, um, but I do know that um, Al Rohr's planning shop um, at Peterson is, is very much engaged uh, with the airport um, in general. Um, so I, I, I feel um, fairly certain that they are, but I will certainly follow up and make sure that they're aware of that. Thank you. Councilmember Knight. <laughs> yes. Following up on uh, Commissioner Clark's uh, Comment, do you have a good point of contact that, you know, we can talk to on these areas? I know on, on City Council, we had a request to do a rezoning for the Broadmoor. They sent post, postcards to their nearest neighbors, one was Shine Mountain, and they sent it to NORAD. Uh, so if you can give us, you know, if either it's in Building 1 or if it's down at the wing, if it's Peterson-related or, you know, out at 50th, if it's Shriver-related, but if he can provide uh, Mr. McDonald uh, and he can pass on to all the council members or all the PBACG members, who's, who's the right point of contact if, if we have a zoning change and we want to get an affirmative response yes, from the remap, who we go to, please, I'd Absolutely. appreciate that. Absolutely. I'll get that to you. Councilmember Miller. Thanks. I appreciate it. I think this is a very important effort, and I actually think that um, including Buckley is very important uh, because one of the criteria for determining which uh, Air National Guard bases will be getting F-35s, it's a huge, it's a noise footprint issue, and encroachment is, is one of the highest issues that's considered when the DOD is making those determinations. But I think, I think there's, there's work to be done between the public and the military, but also within the military, because I know, I mean, even Peterson's a very complex organization. Right. I mean, the Space Wing has command authority, but Air Force Reserve Command has the flying mission there. And, and historically, you know, serving on the Guard, the Reserve, and on the Airport Commission, there's been a lack of communication within the military because they're sort of stovepipe. Right. The space wing might not be aware of issues pertaining to the flying wings, and so I think that's really important on the military side to get that. Same with Buckley. We've got Space Command at Buckley, but the Air National Guard is, has a huge encroachment issue. I mean, there are encroachment issues for line of sight for communications with the space, but there's also airspace issue encroachment. So it would be helpful to have, you know, single points of contact and making sure that within those 
there is there's communication and I, and I echo the uh, request to have a, a point of contact because that is so vital I mean we talked about with amendment 64 concern for for the military and but really the the pr primary and maybe that is a concern but encroachment is it should be number one so if we could when we have land use issues have points of contact we could go to um, that would be terrific and to answer just uh, Colonel Moore if there is a front range uh, Airspace Working Group, which is really a great uh, group that considers um, all the flying organizations, the Air Force Academy, um, DOS Aviation down in Pueblo, the Guard, the Reserve, that works together to try to coordinate some of these airspace um, issues, and also the uh, Air Traffic Control Colorado Springs. So that that is being done very well, uh, to your point. So. Yes, thank you for that input. Um, incidentally, all of our installations have an encroachment management team. And so um, when I provide you the, the point of contact, we'll have a single person, um, but that person has access to an array of functional experts at the installation. So if you're calling for um, you know, contacting them about a zoning issue or an airspace issue or a construction management issue, um, they'll be able to engage that team uh, and provide the correct information. So thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Yes, sir. Um, so I'll be very quick um, on the, the next initiative, the Community Partnerships Initiative. This is um, a new way of doing business for the Air Force. And the model is um, the Army's um, undertaking with the Presidio at Monterey. Some may be familiar with that. But um, in general, um, the city of Monterey has taken over most of the base services um, for the Presidio. And um, the Army, in partnership um, with the city of Monterey, has recognized um, many efficiencies um, in doing business. And so the Air Force has adopted um, this. It's it's very new. Um, this is <laughs> this is the first fiscal year it's been done. Um, Secretary of the Air Force was able to fund 15 projects, um, and we've received two of those here locally um, at Buckley and Peterson. And um, basically, it's a, a huge collaboration effort um, where. Um, community members and installation members are brought together to brainstorm everything under the sun. Nothing is off the table. Um, despite all of our rules and regulations and encumbrances, um, we talk about everything. And um, the, the mantra is, you know, nobody can say no at the beginning. Let's get these on the table and see what we, we really want to pursue. Um, and then through a series of meetings that last on the order of four to six months in total, so there are a series of four to six meetings depending on, um, on how it's organized, um, we sort of narrow down the list and we go through the vetting process. You know, what will it take? What resources? What amount of time is it worth the effort? Um, what's the payback? Um, and the object of these initiatives is not to pass on cost or risk. Um, it's to capitalize on you know, volume um, and things of that nature. So if the city has a waste management contract and Peterson Air Force Base has one and it makes sense um, to join in on that because you know um, per capita we get a better value than then we might choose to, to pursue something like that. Um, so that's the premise. Um, it's working very well. There are some other installations that are ahead of us. Um, but some very common things that are um, discussed in these um, initial meetings are sharing recreational services. In installations have great ball fields. And typically, communities are looking for places to do youth sports. And so those are the kinds of things that can be shared few obstacles to overcome. We have to get people onto the base. You have to create an access list, those kind of things. But they're not things that can't be overcome. We've just never really gone to the trouble of doing it before. Um, but the fiscal environment is um, sort of forcing us into um, changing the way that we think. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, so that's what we're looking at. Um, Council Member Pico. That was very intriguing. So the, the, you're looking for the idea that, say, the city is going to for a number of those services on the base? Um, potentially. Um, it can work both ways. So there can be, um, there may be facilities on the base that the city wants to use and there is no, um, maybe no reciprocation. It's just a mutually beneficial situation. So you can slice it and dice it a lot of different ways. It's not all about the community taking over um, base services, but that might be one scenario that is mutually beneficial. Very intriguing. We'll look forward to hearing more about that. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so um, we've initiated the um, Buckley undertaking. Peterson's is scheduled to kick off um, some this month, what well, will be scheduled to kick off sometime this month, and additionally, um, Mr. Zander from the Secretary's office, along with his Army counterpart, um, is hoping to talk to the Area Chiefs of Staff um, to make them aware of this initiative as well. Um, you're aware of the Fort Carson, um, uh, sort of a similar program that they have going on and we are coordinating with them. Um, one of the concerns that um, we're addressing is, you know, we don't want to be um, too much of a burden on our community partners, inviting all of you to a million meetings. And so we're working with Fort Carson um, to sort of streamline these processes and, and share information and, and meeting space and so forth. And that is all I have. Are there any other questions that I could take? Questions for Lynn? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, always looking for better ways to do business. Um, let's go to item 7D. That is that is not, well, it may be Craig, but uh, the stack report. Uh, we'll, we'll be losing our primary stack member here shortly. The stack agenda is uh, fairly light. It's going to be a pretty quick meeting. The key items are the asset management uh, discussion, policy directive 14, um, and then uh, some discussion on uh, the program distribution. But uh, the asset management and how C it's going to lay out how CDOT uh, is looking to distribute funds, uh, maintenance funds. So that's going to be, see, that's an hour of the hour and a half meeting. So, and the reason that's a, a given a long uh, allocation is because that's most of what CDOT does these days, uh, and so it's it's a fairly important discussion. Um, and uh, our chair's away, so I'm chairing the meeting, so we'll try and keep <laughs> it moving at a reasonable level. Um, the after the business uh, is really where a lot of the important discussion is, which is uh, we have a meeting uh, subsequent to this one about uh, resource allocation as we deal with the various factors. And uh, Craig and I are both playing an active role in that subcommittee trying to ensure that formulas that are used make sense for people of the Pikes Peak region. And as always, uh, I know Norm's been up a number of times and appreciate uh, his presence. And um, so we're happy to have anyone there who wants to join us. I guess one thing to add on to what Wayne, last month, uh, Barbara Kirkmeyer from Weld County pointed out that CDOT's new process is not following state law. I looked it up and she is correct. What CDOT is doing right now is actually not what the state law requires them to do. <laughs> so. Um, it's, well, it's, um, CDOT is adopting a very top-down approach to it, and state law requires a very bottom-up approach. Federal law is actually neutral. They say, here's the output you need. So. Very good. Other comments on stack, upcoming stack meeting? Thank you. Let's take a short break. Um, we'll try to be back in our seats in about six minutes. Can I see? I'm going to talk about projects for $500 million here shortly. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> Should I? I mean, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, last month, uh, Herman Stockinger from CDOT came before you and asked you for a list of projects for a possible ballot initiative in November of 2014. Um, since then, we've had some preliminary discussions with our advisory committees on how to develop that list. You'll see figure one is that uh, is using our long-range transportation plan process and the uh, pri priority projects that it identified to create that list. Uh, figure one, the shaded items are the projects you have identified by resolution as uh, high priority projects in our region. The italicized projects are the projects that we have submitted ramp applications for. You'll see in addition to those projects, we include US 24 widening and an 
uh, from 8th Street to 21st Street and up the Power Central Freeway from Woodman to Carefree. Um, during the discussions with the TAC and CAC, uh, one of the suggestions made was instead of doing the Power Central Freeway projects, let's look at the PPRTA renewal projects that are on state highways and substitute those projects for the Power Central Freeway, and that is what you see as uh, the uh, figure two priority list. Both of these uh, projects, are, um, when Herman was here, he asked for about $300 million for the projects. Uh, we, PPACG staff, looked at how much tax revenues could be generated in our region and uh, created a list of priority pr projects about that line between $400 and uh, $500 million. Um, what we'd like is any additional direction from you before we take these through our advisory committees for action from you next month, um, per CDOT's request. Um, are there any questions on these lists? Questions? Councilmember Knight, were you? Councilmember um, Miller. I'd like to address the Powers Old Ranch interchange and any any uh, consideration of moving that that up. I mean, that's uh, one of the highest death intersections in the city of Colorado Springs. Uh, there's a high school right there. Um, there's I can't remember. I believe there were six deaths last year at that particular intersection. And uh, the, the, it's, that project is included on both. It's uh, just one below the shaded on the figure one. And figure two, it's actually incorporated into the PPRTA renewal projects. There was a funding for that in the RTA renewal. It's, uh, if you look under um, note four, the second one down. So that it's there. It's just it has not been um, identified by the board. But yeah, that is. We, um, in filling out that application, the number of fatalities, it's, I believe, seven times the desired rate for fatal accidents and injuries There's for a, an intersection rate. of that type. <laughs> <laughs> well, desired, sorry, that's not, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the average rate, yeah. What, what, so it's, it is, in our region, that is uh, one of the places we are definitely having way too many crashes and fatalities. And the, the presence of the high school there and uh, some of the more inexperienced drivers are, are traversing that intersection is well, and there's pedestrian issues also with yep. the high school and, and the, the surrounding residential areas so um, in terms of vetting those any any help from the board and moving that up the priority list is is appreciated and I have been in discussions with the CDOT about it my understanding is a, uh, the funding is largely a PPRTA has been provided for, but there's a small portion of it in the ramp application that would kind of make up the difference. And Move it forward. Yeah, the, uh, and the, one of the issues with the um, RTA is the, the funds for that would start being start collected in 2015, so it would be under construction in 2016. Uh, the hope with the ramp applications is it's built starting in 2014, starting next year, and then the PPRTA would pay back CDOT for that $8 million to get it built two, three years earlier than it would if we just rely on the PPRTA. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. Um, so we've got Cimarron on this list. But we've already, uh, where are we, what, what was accepted our application for ramp? Um, the ramp application submission was for 45 or 50 million, I forget which um, dollars, bullet point one. 40 million dollars is funded with STIP, so we have requested 55 million dollars in ramp funds. Um, and it's a three-phase project. There's the acceleration of the STIP projects, there's the ramp public public project, and then there's also the ramp maintenance funds. And those three together uh, make the 95 million dollars in funds. And then September 19th is when the Transportation Commission is going to make a decision on ramp? or is Yes. It Okay. And that's why when, when Herman requested it, they, is, they, he said that your list of projects should include all of your ramp submissions. It should be inclusive of that, and if you, you get the funding in a ramp, just take it off your list. Okay, because I, I don't see, quite see it that way. It seems to me if we put this on the impact list, then it'll be much easier for them to deny our ramp application, saying, oh, well, we'll fund this on that. I don't think that's going to work in this region. I mean, we, we've had promises made not kept before from Denver, and if they expect to come back in 2014 and get any voter support down here, I think we need to really do everything we can to see that Cimarron is up and being constructed and being funded through ramp. And I understand that, but it seems like the timing is suspect to me. It is inconvenient for sure. 
<laughs> and uh, Rob, and again, uh, this is really preliminary discussions with the CDOT process. I mean, they they have to go to the legislature. They have to do a lot of work to create a ballot question and have that complete discussion around the state. Uh, our intent here, as Craig said, is, and certainly the board can take off something off this list to say, oh, we think that's a done deal. We think Cimarron is done. Don't put it forward as a future voter approved list because we anticipate before that vote even happens to be under construction with it. So the, what we did, again, is these are the priorities as set out in the board. Your decisions in a long range plan, the six year transportation improvement program, and your resolutions of a year ago or less saying if the board had three, four hundred million dollars, here are the priority projects. Whether they're funded from ramp or faster federal, state, RTA, and any of your local governments, these are the board approved priorities. So you can narrow the list down, you can expand the list. Why we're here today is CDOT wants something for next month that says these are current your, your priorities. If you have something funded, certainly, or anticipate funding, you can take it off the list, but you can also add to the list. And Greg, you'd like to have an idea from us which list plus or minus projects to to take through the CAC and the TAC. And plus or minus dollars, should we aim for 600 million? Should we cut it back to the 300 million that CDOT asked for? Just any any additional direction you would like to provide, we would be. Can we submit a September 20th? <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Two. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to weigh in on um, what Mayor Snyder had to say on on Cimarron. Um, you know, this, it's interesting, this memo starts talking about the, the Metro Mayor's Caucus and, and, you know, I'll just go ahead and say, you know, the mayor is here, we get together and we chat. In fact, we had a meeting this week and we get concerned about, you know, Cimarron and the importance to a lot of things that goes on in Colorado Springs and affects all of us. And, um, you know, we just want to make sure that doesn't somehow take a second, you know, kind of slide down. As a, as a result of this initiative. We want to make sure that it stays at the top. And uh, so I just wanted to express that and add in on what Mayor Snyder had to say. Thank you. Council Member Knight. Yeah, I want to express my um, endorsement or preferral that we stay with uh, figure one. I mean, last month we consciously made this decision that said we wanted to be consistent and what we're giving the state and our priorities, which is why we told you to, to go that way. And so if all of a sudden we're making some changes, uh, even though it's down at the bottom, then we're diverging from the direction we gave you last time. And, and you know, we figured a consistent list to the state is, is our best approach. Now, rather, we want to take Cimarron off the top because uh, of the implications of that it might hurt our chances with ramp. I'm, I don't have any problem with that, but changing the order or adding, substituting something in or something out before uh, on a priority list that we already gave them, that, that I have a problem with. So I go for figure one. I guess I would advocate for leaving Cimarron on, kind of using your own argument of consistency. Let's let's don't give them any doubt in the ramp process that Cimarron may not be as important, even though that's not what we're saying. But let's go to Mayor Easton. Would that be, I guess, coincident with your thoughts on, on not diluting the potential for Cimarron to be funded? Well, I, sure. I think what we're seeking today is what what input do you all have to take back to the committees, the Citizen Committee and the Transportation Committee? And we can take all these back, including our thoughts, because they can comment too. I mean, they are the technical staff and the citizens. Do they think it's reasonable? You know, what's the strategy, if at all? Do you keep it on to show it's still the priority? It'll be the priority until it gets funded? Or do you say, wait a minute, don't give anyone an opportunity to say, you know, once you wait for this future possible maybe ballot initiative to fund your top priority? And so, again, we're we'll, we'll just want to get the input from the board, take it back to the folks. CDOT's at that discussion as well. And so they may have input from the ramp process. They may have impact from some of the other projects on here that are seeking other funds because we, we do have Tiger 5 for Fillmore, and there are RTA funds in here. So as you can see on both figures, we knocked off I-25 widening, 
it was a priority, but now it's being built. And so if anything else comes through between now and some future ballot question, we can take things off the list. So again, we'll bring all this discussion back to the committees. You'll have it again next month for what you submit to CDOT to say these are reaffirmation of our priorities and go with whatever you decide next month. Yes, Mayor Snyder. Quick, quick question. You said so if, if we say we submit the first list and then uh, Cimarron Interchange gets funded, then we're allowed to take it off? Are we allowed to then put something in its place? I don't know the answer to that. Then if, if that's not the case, then maybe we ought to be uh, submitting a longer, more expansive list. I will say uh, our list is at over $500 million now, and, and Herman did ask for $300 million. So our list is, yeah. Well, I'm asking for six. <laughs> well, I'm asking for the six hundred million that we that, were supposed to have gotten over the last ten years. So I yeah, mean, that, and uh, that that's enough. Commissioner Clark. Um, I, yeah, I, it's not going to be any surprise to anyone that I'm. I think we stay with what we have. I think if we start taking Cimarron off, it's going to send a mixed message that. It's not. I mean, somebody could misinterpret that, and I don't. I don't want any chances. And I, I think it's wonderful that the that folks are looking at other opportunities to fund transportation. But um, uh, hope springs eternal, and I just think it's really important that that we need to keep Cimarron on that list at the very top. And and I'm so I'm for for keeping our current priorities list. And if we're successful in ramp and other things happen, then we can we can then cross that off just like we crossed off I-25 widening and on the um, State Highway 83 to I-25 and, and we can rearrange, but I think we leave it in place. Otherwise, it's sending a mixed message and, and I don't want to confuse anybody with the list that they see to say, oh, look, now Simran is not on that list, so it must not be your highest priority anymore. Commissioner Dwalby. I agree with Sally on the on leaving the list the same. I have a question. When when we went for this when this uh, when you got your transportation funding here, the uh, RTA. Did you specifically say what you're going to spend the money on? You did. So you gave a list of projects, and that's how they got, and that's how the voters voted for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That that was my question because I, I it feels like. If, if your street is an on it or your road is an on it, it feels like you're going to vote against it. I mean, that's the impression I'm getting. And I guess it's different. It, it, we ran one in Park County a few years ago and it lost. And I, I had the feeling that it was because of the specific specificity of the list of projects that were going to be done that caused it to fail. And and maybe, I, I guess then, it's, it's absolutely, you know, it's different in a yeah. rural area and in an oh, urban yeah. area. And then I wonder if what it's going to be like statewide, because are are people in Ure County going to vote for transportation money that's all going to go to Denver and Colorado Springs in their in their view? You know, I, I'm I'm just questioning the whole thought process beside of having a list of things that you're going to do instead of getting the money and then everybody fighting for it. <laughs> but I, I, I'm not sure. Just a, just a thought. Was it six deaths? Other comments as to which list we should put forward or changes we should make? I just was wondering if we, I know you mentioned 300 million and we have 531 on there now. Uh, but I guess I'd ask for a lot of more. Throw a few more projects on there. I'm more than happy to ask for more. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll defer to the collective wisdom of the board whether they feel that's a good idea or not. But my, an, my vote would be to add a few more projects on the end. As an information item, the next project down the list would be an interchange in powers at Constitution. It individually actually scores higher than the powers, uh, the set of powers freeways, but collectively the value of those projects versus just the single edit Constitution. So if following our process through the next one would be the Powers Constitution Interchange. And how much so. was that one? That's an expensive one. It's 80 or $85 million That would work own. for me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would round it out nicely. It rounds it out nicely for me. But, uh. So what, what are we telling um, Craig to go forward with? I've heard one. I think figure one. Figure, yeah, figure one, one plus the Constitution. One. Yeah. Okay. 
Perfect. Thank Let, you very let's much. Let's see what, what your groups come back with. Okay. Thank you. Seven C. Good for them. Seven <laughs> C is our uh, ramp applications update. Um, sort of continuing the discussion, uh, we submitted on July first. We submitted the uh, projects uh, for uh, f the final applications for ramp funding. Um, the net, we are listening. We have not heard anything since then. We submitted them. Got an acknowledgement of receipts, um, and that is it. <laughs> We've received your email. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Love it. Um, the uh, next steps um, over the next month, uh, CEDA has a subject matter expert panel that is going through all the applications, and they're giving each uh, application a highly recommended, recommended, or not recommended status. After they complete that, a week later, there will be the um, operations, the senior staff, will go through and then hard rank those projects, one to 203. Um, my expectation is the projects that receive a highly recommended will be ranked, the lowest of those will still be above the recommended status, but I honestly don't know. Um, they will, um, the funding that we're going after the partnership, there will actually be a, like a separate rank between the public-public projects and the public-private projects, which brings up an issue. The rumors we've heard is they're gonna split those funds 50-50, except there were only 23 public-private applications and there were 180 public-public applications. <laughs> so if you're a, a submitted a public-private application, your chances are, you know, seem to be much better than a public-public application. Um, after those, those rankings, it goes to the uh, RAMP Sponsor Coalition, the executive team at CDOT, and they uh, look through the recommendations in the ranking and then make a recommendation to the executive director of CDOT. Um, and then that is what is taken to the stack. Um, th the uh, interesting thing to note is that that last recommendation will be inclusive of non-technical factors such as geographic and rural urban, rural urban equity. So it's like we've got a very quantity, you know, the hard, you know, here's the ranking, and then here's where we look at the map and say, okay, make sure we spread the peanut butter around. So um, any questions? Other than that, that is literally all we know right now. Um, in that case, there's probably not much point in asking too many more questions. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> well, thank you. Yep. Obviously, we are anxiously awaiting, yes. so, so if you hear anything, let well, us know. Well, my expectation is that we submitted uh, the six best projects that, uh, statewide. So. I agree with you. 7E. Regional non-motorized plan update. Um, actually, as some of you know, we kicked off our regional non-motorized plan uh, public involvement at the Bike to Work Day. We signed up over 300 interested citizens in um, participating in our project. We're taking a little bit of a different approach this time. It's a much more collaborative process. We have funding partners, uh, City of Colorado Springs, El Paso County, Woodland Park, and the Trails and Open Space Coalition. Um, in the case of the public entities, they're in the process of updating their own uh, sidewalk, non-motorized plan, and so it's more cost-effective for us to do our plan and their plan together. It also ensures that our plans are integrated, coordinated, you know, all those all those good words. Um, the uh, one of the key factors we're looking for in this is to get more outreach to the general public. Uh, last time, one of the comments was we talked to, you know, for lack of a better term, the spandex crowd, the bicycle clubs, and not the. Uh, um, not the general public, and so we're trying to figure out. <laughs> I wear spandex too. <laughs> <laughs> if you have more than one set, spandex is okay. But if you have more than one set, then you. So. Um, I definitely have more than one set. <laughs> so, um, and so it it uh, it did it wasn't as uh, broad based. It wasn't as um, potentially useful as you know as uh, across the population spectrum as, as it could have been. So we're, we're lo looking at the team we hired uh, is really going to focus on that. They're actually bringing some of the Web 2.0, where if you have a smartphone, you take a picture of it, smartphones geo-reference the picture, you put a comment on it, submit it to our website, and it pops up on the map for everybody to see and comment on. So everybody can see, yeah, there's, this, there's a connection. How do I get across Academy Boulevard here? And so that will uh, we'll get a lot of that um, outreach uh, from the public, uh, ideally. Uh, it's, Commissioner I've, Clark. I have kind of a strange question. Somebody called me the other day um, with regard to Segways, the little two-wheel thing, Segways, whatever they're called. Um, I've just been on them a couple of times. 
is that part of our non-motorized transportation? Because they take up sidewalk space, road space, and yet they're becoming a great draw for people who want to see parts of, of your community without riding a bike or getting in a car. I guess the answer to that is yes and no. Um, they are allowed in the uh, bike lanes on, on the on-road, but they are not allowed on trails um, there because they're a motorized vehicle, so they're not technically allowed on trails. Um, and I'm just saying that maybe that, I mean, uh, we need to think about the changing types of transportation, and that's one of them that's becoming very popular in cities all over the country who uh, want to bring in those tourists and, and want to do all kinds of touring. So, well, With the Trails and Open Space Coalition, what they're actually um, partnered with us on is an economic impact study of non-motorized systems in our region and the potential benefits, you know, of drawing additional tourists, you know, on our, like, a, um, up the Pikes Peak or trails um, connecting to the Alpine Loop, I believe it's called. Um, and so we were looking at what is the potential economic impact of investments that could bring in, the, you know, what's the, I guess, the magnifier of bringing those in. So we, um, that would be part of that tourism impact, I believe. So... Uh, I just I think it needs to be considered because it, it is a draw. They are a draw, and there, there's studies in Wisconsin and Minnesota that show just incredible amount of yeah. uh, uh, tourism All brought in and, and money brought in from really pretty minor bike paths that aren't you know anything like. Well, that. and I had somebody approach me about using them in Old Colorado City, and I don't you know I don't know what the. Yeah, I, see, I don't believe they're allowed on sidewalks, or, and I know they're not allowed on the trails. The, but at the bike lanes, I'm pretty sure they can they can travel in. But if you don't have a bike lane, where do you put them? Yeah, exactly. Um, Mayor Schneider? Uh, well, I think state law says anything 50 cc's or less, including segways and those scooters, um, have, have the same rights as bicyclists on, on state, on the roads, okay. the roadways. But you, I think you may be correct on the uh, trails. Certainly, they're not allowed there. But Councilmember Miller? Yeah, and I received a number of emails about the longboard issue, which I think that one's growing also. So I don't know if that's something that's in the non-motorized. We've stayed away from that. We can definitely address it. Um, from the regional standpoint, we try to let the locals, because it could be that the Colorado Springs deals with differently than Green Mountain Falls or Palmer Lake. Um, we can definitely, as part of our operational, that is well within our purview. We have chosen previously, we you not to get into that debate and let the local entities they're totally used on the on the Breckenridge bike path and they're amazingly efficient vehicles so <laughs> when you're coming down from Copper Mountain to into Frisco they're going 30 miles an hour just cruising along and they're not pedaling or anything I'm, I mean I'm pedaling to keep up with them and, and, and come, going from Breck down to Frisco same thing they're cruising along keeping the same speeds it, it's on the downhill that they're you know, to have their efficiency, but it's an amazing vehicle. They really do travel well. Surprised me. So we can definitely make sure to include that. I think that would be helpful at least to consider it. Okay. What else, Craig? Um, that is it. Uh, if you, uh, for additional information, we have lots and lots of these. If you, if anybody desires them, let us know and we will get you, we'll be like Kate. And here's a pack, go around, take, take some, so. But it's about a 15-month process. Um, it'll coordinate with the adoption of our regional overall transportation plan. Thank you. Thank you. Item F, Arkansas River Basin Standards and Classification Update. Rich, still here. Thanks. Just wanted to recap um, the Arkansas River Basin Standards and Classifications hearing that was held in June. Um, folks who might recall at the March and May PPHG board meetings, I discussed some of the issues and concerns as part of the uh, class, classification standards rulemaking hearing. Um, the hearing was in June and, and um, the pertinent uh, decisions that were made were included in the memo. Uh, typically for these hearings, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment Water Quality Control Division submits a proposal that kind of lists all the, all the proposed changes to the standards and and classifications uh, to the Water Quality Control Commission. Then other parties such as AFCUR and, and PPACG submit um, external proposals or comment on the, the division's proposal. So 
um, for this for this hearing, um, there was there was some agreement uh, that the commission had with uh, with some of our proposals and um, and some d disagreement with our proposals and um, some siding with the division on their recommendations. What typically happens is we try to work out the issues ahead of time with the water quality control division because if if the division agrees with us. Um, when we go in into the rulemaking hearing, there's a lot of, a lot more credibility because usually they give, a, I'd say, deference to kind of what the division per, proposes in the rulemaking hearings. So in the, um, on page one, you can see that uh, the last bullet there, the um, Tri Lakes Wastewater Treatment Facility, the, um, the site-specific stand for copper. Um, a lot of those issues were worked out ahead of time, along with the Cherokee Metropolitan, the Cherokee Metropolitan District's proposal um, with the division. So when those moved forward, there was uh, um, both support from AFCURE and the division. But um, for the first bullet, we had a meeting um, to discuss the use protected designation for segment four, and I guess you could just say we agreed to disagree um, in going into the commission. and. And the commission actually sided with uh, AFCUR and, and PPACG and the members of, of AFCUR. Um, the upshot of this is that the, the commission really respected um, the, the development of AFCUR because it's 11 a a entities, um, which are um, a combination of El Paso County and Pueblo County g getting together and, and making recommendations and working together. So the commission really said they, they support uh, the work that AFCUR is doing, uh, but we still need to do more work to go ahead and look at uh, gathering and collecting information and in, in developing site-specific standards for temperature, selenium, other types of, of metals, uh, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, chlor chlorophyll A. The, the concern is that we want to make sure that the standards set here are are appropriate because if, if they're too stringent in some cases, then, then what's going to happen is that um, you know, mo modifications to wastewater treatment plants will be made and they'll end up costing taxpayers money where they might not necessarily be, I guess, pr protective of the uh, aquatic life and the macro invertebrate. So with that, we're, we're still working on some of, of the issues we need to, like the resegmentation and, um, and additional monitoring. Are there any questions? Yeah. Commissioner Dwalby. In Alma, we have, a, when I was mayor, there was a regulation that said that the water coming out of the plant had to be a percentage cleaner than the water coming into the plant. And in an Alma, in the wintertime, everybody runs water to bleed their pipes. Yeah. So their pipes don't freeze. So you have this really clean water coming into the system. <laughs> it's very difficult to clean it twice as clean as it already is when it's already coming into our plant cleaner than the water coming out of your taps. So is there is there any effort being made on, on this level to uh, Consider the situation that small communities are in, high in the mountains, and, and, and what they have to go through to meet state standards. Yeah, I mean, we've been looking at uh, lagoon systems such as uh, Alma has, um, you know, where you guys have have, uh, have problems, you know, especially meeting the standards in, in the wintertime, like, you know, with, um, but the water you, coming you, you out of our sewer is cleaner than the water right. coming out of your sewer. So, <laughs> so <laughs> can't they do that? Can't they test it that way instead of that? comparing it what it comes in? To, you know, there, there's these expenses. Sure, uh, the place the spent six million dollars on their plant. Now they're having to do another phosphorus change to the plant. Right, and and we've been looking at kind of for uh, for nutrients such as total nitrogen um, for. Plants that are have a smaller capacity, such as uh, Alma, to go ahead and um, give them a variance. So, so, so they are subject. The plant than there are above so they the aren't plant. subject to to, <laughs> to the same standards. Yeah, and you know, and that's a you know an, another issue that that we're looking at. I mean, you know, um, you know the standards that are above you know the the discharge to some of the plants. You know, have 
have those standards be be different than this than the standards put below the plants. I mean, there's a, a lot of kind of, I guess, inner connection uh, be, be between the, the standards and, and kind of uh, what some of the smaller communities are are going through because you know you know the incomes you know we're trying to get them to take a look at kind of the average incomes and if the rates go up you know what what impact that will have on the um, economic conditions and some of the smaller communities so we're 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 working it I guess all right thank you sure. Jim Godfrey just a question um, rich yeah uh, Jim Godfrey uh, chat care um, <clears throat> Division of Wildlife years ago was looking at a study of what is an acceptable level of various mineral content to sustain uh, fish and invertebrates in the streams, particularly along um, Blue River and some of the areas that are heavily influenced by the mining and that stuff. And um, <clears throat> rather than set a standard that says zero, which is very expensive to attain, uh, what is the acceptable level that would sustain wildlife? And they were sampling and doing on different fish. Are you aware, or do you know whether any of that has been published or whether the commission is considering that? I, I'm not aware of that exact study. I mean, what happens is, is the standards are attached to, to the stream segments based on how they're, how, how they're classified. So there's different standards for uh, cold cold water aquatic habitat uh, versus warm water aquatic habitat, and then just um, between those two different uh, types, there's two different tiers. So it, essentially, you have you know four different possibilities of uh, of standards depending upon the the uses, and then you have four different types of uh, of recreation, uh, water supply, agriculture. Just all depends what what the standards, what the classified uses are to how those standards are attached. So I'm not familiar with that particular study, but I, I can uh, go, go ahead and, and, Guys in Fort Collins, and uh, get get together with you uh, to try to find out. Other comments? Rich, anything else? No, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Item eight is member entity announcements. Anything for the good of the group? <laughs> County Fair. County Fair. Weekend after next, I'm a festival in the clouds, and it's really fun. Really fun. Do we have to wear spandex? We can wear just regular. <laughs> the question is, can, can, we, can we wear spandex? Wear a suit tie, though. No suits. Okay. No suit tie. <laughs> Rob, uh, on your on your table is uh, an announcement by the state of Colorado, the Transportation Legislation Review Committee. Uh, has announced uh, a set of meetings to talk about uh, looks like transportation finance and Colorado infrastructure. The meeting down here looks like August 20th. So we'll, when we get more information like where it's going to be uh, an exact time, we'll, we'll let you know. Uh, we're thinking it's related to Impact 64, but it may not be. Uh, so once they put out an agenda, we'll email that out to everybody. It's just a uh, Heads up, save the date, kind of, if you want to. But okay. Thank you. Anything else? And you have the meeting schedule. Seeing nothing else to come before this board, do we have a motion to adjourn? Move. Second. <laughs> On favor? Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs>